World War I. Four years of bitter conflict. Known as the Great War or the war to end all wars. It's grim trench warfare. With Europe, the main theater of war. But this was a war fought on many fronts. So there's another story, rarely told of huge importance during the war and of lasting significance. A story of troops who fought and died, but who are often forgotten and of an outcome that shaped the Middle East of today. This is World War I through Arab eyes. Malik Tariki, the Tunisian writer and broadcaster, is taking us on a personal journey across a dozen countries. His grandfather's generation fought in the war. So far, he's looked at the contributions made by Arab North African troops conscripted by the British and French colonial powers in North Africa. how and why the Ottoman Empire joined Germany in the war, pitting its Arab troops against their Muslim brothers fighting for the Allies. And as Ottoman fortunes declined, how the Europeans, Russians and Arabs looked to fill the power vacuum. وإطلاق اسم الرجل المريض على الدولة العثمانية الرجل المريض الذي ينتظر ورثته اقتسام ثروته In this episode he sees how the shape of a new Middle East was decided in secret by British and French diplomats If you look at a map at the beginning of the war you have an Ottoman Empire that ruled over a tiny sliver of Europe all of the Anatolian Peninsula, southwestern Asia, parts of North Africa, parts of the Arabian Peninsula. At the end of the war, that's gone. How Britain made separate promises to three different interest groups that were all incompatible with each other. According to the Hussein McMahon correspondence, Palestine belonged to an Arab state. According to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, Palestine was going to be internationalized. According to the Balfour Declaration, it was going to go to the Jews. So how do you square that circle? And how this colonial self-interest blew away the nationalist hopes of millions of Arabs for post-war independence. This is Whitehall, the center of power from where the British imperial establishment decided to destroy their old ally, the Ottoman Empire, and create a new order in the Arab East. The Arabs are still living with the consequences to this very day. Almost as soon as the Ottoman Empire joined the war in November 1914, the European allies began staking their claims. In March 1915, Russia announced it wanted Istanbul and the straits linking the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. France accepted Russia's claim and set out its own plans. 
They wanted the southeast Turkish coast and greater Syria. Then, in June 1915, Britain announced it wanted the whole western coast of the Arabian Gulf, plus all of Mesopotamia. Britain also wanted to control a strip of land from there to Haifa on which to build a railway. It would give them an alternative route to India and one day might carry Gulf oil. The British already had serious interests in the Ottoman Empire. They had already occupied Egypt. They had already moved into the Gulf states. They already had interests in southern Mesopotamia. They already had oil interests in the Gulf. So the war suddenly brought all of this then right to the forefront. So in order to achieve this, between 1915 and 1917, Britain entered into three separate agreements, which all conflicted with one another. One with Hussein bin Ali, the Sharif of Mecca, to give him an Arab state in return for leading a revolt against the Ottomans. Another with the Zionist movement to create a Jewish national home in Palestine and a secret pact with its Entente ally France to divide the Levant and Mesopotamia between them. Donc c'est sur sur ces sur ces bases qu'on qu effectue le partage avec l'idée donc pour la France de s'assurer cette zone que ses représentants enfin les représentants de ce qu'on peut appeler le parti colonial espère euh, occuper depuis longtemps et pour la Grande-Bretagne donc de se garantir ce qui lui paraît indispensable pour la sécurité de la route des Indes, c'est-à-dire le golfe persique, la, la, la débouché du golfe arabo-persique d'une part, et puis la mer Rouge d'autre part. While the British were still negotiating with Sharif Hossein over his potential revolt, in 1915, they and France appointed delegates to draw up this secret deal for dividing up Ottoman territory. The French were represented by Charles-François-Georges Picot, the former consul general in Beirut, and the British by the government's Middle East advisor, Sir Mark Sykes. Sykes was from a wealthy English family whose country home was here, at Sledmere House in Yorkshire. He had a privileged upbringing and was taken on a trip to Egypt when he was 11. His knowledge of the Middle East had been picked up writing religion and travel books. Though Sykes liked the Prime Minister to think he was an expert, in fact, he spoke neither Turkish nor Arabic. Georges Picot was a French lawyer turned diplomat who'd spent several years in Beirut and was a staunch supporter of French interests abroad. Though they paid lip service to independence for the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, the ambitions of their respective countries were their real priorities. It's often the case that people assume that people like Sir Mark Sykes and other British and indeed French policymakers were being disingenuous in their support for the idea of national freedom in the Middle East, that at base it was just frankly a lie, that they weren't sincere in their support for this idea of a new era of national freedom, because how could they be when they had their own very clear British-French imperial objectives in the Middle East? At this stage, this was a paper exercise dependent on the course of the war. Donc à partir de ce moment-là, on envisage véritablement une, un partage. Bon, alors c'est un partage évidemment qui va être négocié mais qui est un partage tout théorique puisqu'à l'époque aucun territoire aucun territoire arabe n'est encore occupé. Les armées donc anglaises sont encore sur le canal de Suez. Elles ont essayé de monter une expédition contre la Mésopotamie mais ça a été un échec, hein. elles ont été obligées de, de capituler à Kout al Amara et puis finalement donc les armées et les armées alliées ne n'entre pas du tout dans le, dans le territoire arabe. Les seules choses qui ont été tentées, ben enfin c'est un élément important évidemment, euh, ce sont les accords qui ont été signés en 1915 entre 
le shérif Oussaïd, donc, euh, de la Mecque, et le représentant, le haut commissaire euh, en Égypte, euh, Henry McMahon, hein, sur, euh, justement, euh, d'une part pour susciter une révolte arabe, et d'autre part pour promettre un grand royaume arabe. A world away from the Arab provinces, at the heart of British government in London, Sir Mark Sykes prepared for his negotiations with Georges Picot. He told British Prime Minister Herbert Asquith, I should like to draw a line from the E in Acre to the last K in Kirkuk. And face to face with Georges Picot, that's precisely what he did. He called it practical politics. The Sykes-Picot agreement was concluded in October 1916. Russia supported it on condition that its own claims to Ottoman territory were accepted by Britain and France. Sykes-Picot drew the map of the Middle East in red and blue. The red zone marked the province of Baghdad, in which the British would have the right to establish such direct or indirect administration or control as they desire. The blue zone covered Cilicia and the Syrian coast, where France would have the same rights. Britain also claimed informal control over an area of northern Arabia, from Kirkuk to Gaza. The French claimed the same informal control over a triangle from Mosul to Aleppo and Damascus. This deal was what the Palestinian writer George Antonius later called a startling piece of double dealing. In June 1916, Sharif Hussein started the Arab revolt against the Ottomans, fulfilling his part of his deal with the British. Only four months later, Sykes-Picot was signed, contradicting the British pledge to the Arab people. What we have to realize, though, is that what we see as duplicity was actually explained by their ideas of the people of the region at the time. And at root of this was their racial outlook of the British policy-making elite at the time of the First World War. They assumed that these peoples couldn't possibly believe for a moment that when the British and the French talked of national freedom, that it actually meant political independence. That would have been a completely crazy idea to their minds because of their racial conviction that the Arab world was backward and, to a lesser degree, the Jewish world too. The Sykes-Picot deal remained a British, French and Russian secret for a year. But after the Russian Revolution in November 1917, the Bolsheviks took Russia out of the war. The new leaders, Lenin and Trotsky, soon discovered that the Tsarist government had supported the Sykes-Picot agreement. The communist daily newspaper Pravda broke the story of the three European allies' deception to the world. Following the revolutionary government's decision to extract Russia from the war, Pravda published what might be its only great exclusive. In November 1917, under the directions of both Lenin and Trotsky, it revealed the details of the secret Sykes-Picot agreement. Thus, the Soviets uncovered Europe's imperial plans to divide the Middle East between Britain and France. The cat was out of the bag, but difficult to believe it had little immediate impact on the course of the war or on the Arab world. All that really mattered now was military conquest, boots on the ground. Politicians could make whatever deals they liked, but occupation was nine-tenths of the law, from the Red Sea to Turkey. The entire region from Aqaba uh, to, to the Taurus Mountains was occupied. They were occupied because they were crucially important to British war aims, because of Suez, because of Egypt, because of the air route to India, because of the oil fields in, in, uh, in Iran, 
uh, in Mesopotamia, because of the, the trucial states around the Gulf. All of these were crucial British war aims from the very beginning. But now, what to do with all this occupied land? The answer, new states, whether or not they respected ethnic, religious, or tribal borders. Not only did Sir Mark Sykes draw lines on the maps, his artistic skills were put to further use. It is the ultimate irony that Mark Sykes, a man so universally detested in the Arab East, should be responsible for the design of the flags, the symbols of national sovereignty of so many Arab countries. Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Kuwait, Yemen, the Emirates, even the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Sykes' deal with Georges Picot was never formally enacted on the ground, but it did bear a close resemblance to the way the British Prime Minister and French President carved things up at the end of the war. The partition was a fact of occupation. And then the British and the French negotiated, and Clemenceau and Lloyd George themselves negotiated probably in a taxi between Victoria Station and, uh, and 10 Downing Street when Clemenceau arrived in, in London uh, in, in December of 1918. So it was completely casual and resisted and opposed by virtually everyone in the region. Sir Mark Sykes died soon after the war, aged 39. He cast a long shadow across the Arab world, especially Palestine. On Sykes-Picot's map, it was colored brown, an area under international administration yet to be decided. Of Britain's three wartime promises, the one made by Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour proved the most enduring and controversial. كانت معاهدة سايكس بيكو أول مؤامرة على العرب سرية لم يدري بها العرب لا المثقفون ولا السياسيون ولا الشريف حسين. طيب تلاها مؤامرة أخرى وهو صدور بتصريح بالفور. There were many reasons for Balfour's promise. After centuries of anti-Semitism in Russia and Europe, Jews had started to settle in Palestine. The Jewish nationalist movement, Zionism, was gaining momentum. Its leader was a Russian-born chemistry professor in Manchester called Chaim Weizmann. The Weizmann process for producing acetone fed Britain's wartime munitions production and his notoriety enabled him to lobby the British government to support a Jewish national home in Palestine. In June 1917, Weizmann and the Jewish banker and politician Walter Rothschild met Arthur Balfour in London to request a formal declaration of support for Zionism. Five months later came his reply. On the 2nd of November, Balfour wrote to Rothschild to say that the government viewed with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this project. This is the famous Balfour Declaration, the letter that uh, Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour sent in November 1917 to Lord Rothschild. As Arthur Kersler put it, the Balfour Declaration meant that one nation promised to a second nation the country of a third. What is extraordinary is that this letter was not drafted by Balfour or his staff. Instead, it was drafted for him by Chaim Weizmann, the future president of Israel. I think if we're trying to understand the British imperial establishments uh, relationship with Zionism from the time of the First World War, that it's absolutely key that we recognize the significance of the Bible 
in British culture. So that the narratives of Zionism, of the ancient Jewish nation, in the landscape of the Bible, returning to its former glories, was an idea that was not only familiar to many people in Britain by the time of the First World War, but romantic as well. There were also wider strategic reasons for supporting Zionism. Jewish influence was strong in the government of Britain's new war ally, the United States, under President Woodrow Wilson. Two of Woodrow Wilson's top advisors, Felix uh, Frankfurter on the one hand and Louis Brandeis on the other hand, were ardent Zionists. Now, the British were very suspicious of Woodrow Wilson, although the, the United States had already entered the war. And the British were also very suspicious of the huge amount of German, uh, German immigrants in the United States and Irish immigrants in the United States uh, that were opposed to Britain and the British Empire. So what they wanted to do was somehow get the United States, make sure the United States stayed on board in the First World, World War. And what that, of course, entailed was making sure that Woodrow Wilson's top advisors kept on pushing him, giving him a goal uh, giving uh, them a goal to fight for uh, to the bitter end. And the other power the British wanted to keep happy was Russia. The idea that, as the British thought, most many of the Bolsheviks had Jewish backgrounds. Leon Trotsky's uh, real name was Bronstein, after all. Uh, and what the British thought, once you scratch these people underneath, they're really Jewish. So therefore, what we've got to do is we've got to give them something that will um, uh, uh, appease them to make sure that they would stay in the war and fight to the bitter end as well. Didn't quite work out that way. And just as Mark Sykes had called his approach to negotiating with the French as practical politics, there was good old British pragmatism. The idea of having a Jewish colony somewhere to the north of the Suez Canal. The British were in Egypt, you had the Suez Canal, and in the north you would have a Jewish colony that would be very dependent on the British. And of course, the main British strategic uh, goal was to protect the route to India. Lloyd George and the people around him sat down and thought to themselves, what's it going to cost us? If it doesn't cost us anything, it might have some benefit. Why don't we just do it? Little did they know how much it was going to end up costing. Still to come, the Arab bid for independence from Ottoman rule, Sharif Hussein's revolt. The idea of the mandate, the League of Nations term for continued foreign rule. And the long-term impact on the Arab world of British and French double dealing. Malik Tariki, the Tunisian writer and broadcaster, is telling the story of the First World War from an Arab perspective. In 1915 and 16, the war in Europe was bloody, merciless and unrelenting. The British and French were bogged down in the trenches against a stubborn German enemy. But it was a different kind of war in the Middle East, Britain's strategy was to capitalize on growing Arab nationalist feeling against four centuries of Ottoman rule. وطلبوا من الشريف حسين أن يرأس هذه الثورة. 
In 1915, the British High Commissioner in Cairo, Sir Henry McMahon, began negotiating an alliance with Hussein bin Ali, the Sharif of Mecca. An exchange of letters took place between McMahon and Hussein about the possibility of joining some sort of revolt against the Ottomans. The result of that was that the British promised uh, Sharif Hussein and his sons uh, gold and guns uh, and an Arab state or states to be founded after the war was over. And in return for that, they would declare war on the Ottomans themselves. Sharif Hussein was also the choice of Arab secret resistance groups. But it was far from simple. All of this maneuvering was going on at the same time as the British and French representatives, Marc Sykes and Francois Georges Picot, were carving up the Middle East between them. Sharif Hussein dreamt of a great Arab state to include the Levant from the Egyptian border up to the Taurus Mountains in Turkey, plus all of Mesopotamia to the border in the north, and the whole of the Arabian Peninsula, except for the British colony of Aden. <laughs> Britain weighed up the benefits and agreed to Sharif Hussein's demands. For his part, Hussein called for an Arab uprising against the Ottomans on the 5th of June, 1916. The Hashemite forces, under the command of Hussein's son, Faisal, mobilized. From their base at Aqaba, they attacked the Ottoman supply line, the Hejaz Railway. They found the Arab tribesmen of Transjordan a tough nut to crack. The line here today at Al Qatrana is near the Jordanian town of Ma'an, a tribal stronghold that the Hashemites were never able to capture. Before the war, the Hejaz Railway had been a way for Arabs here to travel from Al Qutrana to new destinations. A hundred years on, the trains don't stop here anymore. When Faisal's Hashemites moved north in 1918 and formed a pincer movement with General Allenby's British divisions in Palestine, they were able to take Damascus on the 2nd of October. The big battles were occurring in Europe. This was the right flank of an army that was invading north from Egypt and up the coast of the Mediterranean, eventually to end up in Aleppo. After taking greater Syria, Faisal felt he'd achieved his objective and fully expected the British to deliver on their promises. Ottoman rule of the Levant was at an end, and in a month, the war would be over. The armistice was signed on the 11th of November, 1918. The Arabs who'd fought for the victorious allies thought it was payback time. They expected sovereignty and independence. That was how it was understood in the Arab world. The real problem for the region is that although the British government unleashed this idea, took the genie out of the bottle of the idea of national freedom, the British understanding, and certainly the French understanding, of what national freedom would mean for the region was very, very different from how it was conceived across the region 
itself. First to react was Egypt. Its people had paid a high price for supporting the British. Of the 1.2 million men deployed in different roles in World War I battlefields, 500,000 perished. A few months after the war ended, the Egyptian politician and statesman Saad Zaglul asked the British High Commissioner if he could lead a delegation to the Paris Peace Conference. He wanted to negotiate Egyptian independence. Zaglul and his supporters tried to put pressure on the king to change the relationship with the British. The king has a respect within, I would say, ordinary Egyptians. But at that stage, that respect has disappeared. Why? Because of the uh, loss of Egyptians in the war, with the economic ramification on the people's life. All of this actually created a wider gap between the king and the Egyptian people, which facilitated the efforts of Saad Zaghloul to wider the gap more and more with the, with the king and with the British, because they wanted to make sure that British has no place in Egypt after what happened in the First World War. The British arrested Zaglul and his companions in March 1919 and exiled them to Malta. Egypt exploded into revolution. Faced with mass civil disobedience, the British released Zaglul and allowed him to travel to Paris. But when he arrived, he was devastated to learn that the British protectorate over Egypt had already been recognized. The Allies sit down in Paris afterwards, and it, it should be pretty easy to, to hammer out some sort of peace settlement, but it's virtually impossible. There's just too many contradictory agreements, which is why they had to start again from scratch. And one of the agreements was with the Hashemites. Prince Faisal also traveled to Versailles in the hope of achieving his family's goal of a greater Arab state. But a united Arabia was the last thing the Allies wanted and the Arabs would now learn a new term, mandate. This concept Faisal's disappointment in Versailles didn't stop him from seizing his opportunity. In Damascus in March 1920, he declared the Syrian Arab Kingdom as an independent state, with himself as king. Faisal's declaration of an independent state was the deal he had with the British. But the French, with Sykes-Picot heavily in mind, had very different ideas. On the 24th of July, 1920, a small force of Arab volunteers gathered at Maisaloun to try to stop the French army reaching Damascus. But the French troops routed the Arab nationalists and swept on to the Syrian capital. King Faisal fled to London. The first independent Arab state, the Kingdom of Syria, lasted less than four months. The French occupation of Syria turned into a mandate in 1922 and lasted until 1936, with all the problems it entailed and which are still felt today. The 
دولتين سنية دمشق وحلب وبعدين وضع سانجاك الإسكندرونة اللي في مدينة أنطاكيا مدينة أنطاكيا هي مركز المسيحية العربية وبعدين الفرنساويين عطوها للأتراك ونحن سكتنا جذورنا كنا مسلمين ومسيحيين بأنطاكيا the French mandate also had a big impact on Lebanon. تأسيس نظام طائفي بلبنان بالأول كان بشكل ليبرالي إذا بدأ بس بعدين صار بشكل شرس حتى أيام الانتداب الفرنسي بلبنان وقت ما صار في كتلة مسيحية كبيرة كان بدأ تصوت لرئاسة الجمهورية للشيخ جليل الشيخ محمد الجسر مفتي طرابلس اجى المندوب السامي وقف الانتخاب انه هي دوله مسيحيه انتبهوا فهالجو الطائفي والمذهبي من ذلك الحين تواجد The religious and ethnic divisions created by the French mandate in the 1920s and 30s have had a lasting effect on both Syria and Lebanon. leading to a string of internal and cross-border conflicts in both countries. The problems experienced in the past three decades in Iraq also date back to the British mandate. In March 1917, British forces captured Baghdad, ending Ottoman rule in Mesopotamia. Three years later, in April 1920, the League of Nations assigned Iraq to Britain as a formal mandate. They had interest of Iraq because they have also strong presence in the Gulf as well and in south of Iran. So basically they have a good knowledge about what's happening in Iraq. And they built strong relations with the tribes in Iraq. In the light of what's happening basically and, and the failure of, of deliver to the Arabs and establish what's so-called an Arab state, and, and the Hashemite basically they have good linkage with Arab nationalists in Iraq. All of this together uh, helped to mobilize people and they have 1920 revolution. In May 1920, the Iraqis, a mix of Kurds, Sunni Arabs and Shia, began peaceful protests in Baghdad. The British arrested the leaders and sparked violent confrontation. They then crushed the Iraqi uprising with overwhelming force. 2,200 British and Indian soldiers were killed, but around 8,500 Iraqis were killed or wounded. By now, many Arabs were starting to look back on Ottoman rule as preferable to being under the British and French mandates. Arab people believed that they could seek greater ties with the Turkish people because most Arab people saw the Turks as fellow Muslims who were fighting a similar issue, European occupation. But the defeated Ottomans were also facing a changed world. Five countries occupied parts of present-day Turkey. The Treaty of Severn near Paris in August 1920 laid out the Allies' harsh post-war terms. The Turks turned to the hero of Gallipoli, the army officer who led the Ottoman defeat of the Allies in the Dardanelles in 1915. The conditions the uh, Treaty of Sever placed on the Ottoman Empire were extreme. So extreme that uh, Kemal Ataturk and the Turkish nation would refuse them and repel five invading European armies. Mustafa Kemal managed to command the Turks to victory in what became the Turkish War of Independence. 
أن هذا جعل مصطفى كمال معجزة أمام الأتراك بعبقرية مصطفى كمال استطاع أن يوحد تركيا وأن يجعلها دولة واحدة وأجبر الدول الغربية على الاعتراف باستقلال تركيا وبوحدتها الجغرافية والسياسية عام 1923 بعدها ألغى السلطنة ثم ألغى الخلافة بعدها بعام سنة 1924 ومنذ إذن بدأ بحملته الإصلاحية أي بتخليص تركيا من طبعها الإسلامي الذي أثار حفيظة العرب والمسلمين في جميع أنحاء العالم With the bond between Arab and Turk now broken, Mustafa Kemal and the independent Turkish state turned their backs not only on their own past, but on the Arab peoples as a whole. The Arabs were now on their own. When it becomes clear that the occupation of these regions is going to take place, that the British and French armies are not going to leave, that the British and French empires, states, are going to impose a colonial regime, armed opposition, armed revolt becomes an obvious and almost foregone conclusion. Fawzi al-Hawaji was one of the Arab generation that lived through the horrors of World War I. He started as an officer in the Ottoman army, but after the war, he joined King Faisal when he ruled Syria, and Fawzi also fought at Maysaloon in 1920. When the Syrian revolution against the French erupted five years later, he didn't hesitate to join the nationalist side. Malik talked to al Khawaji's close friend, Yahya al-Hakim, in this house in Beirut, where he and Fawzi used to meet. In the 25 Sultan Pasha al-Atrash in Sweden, the war on the French, فوراً أعلن انضمامه وأعلن من حما يعني انضمام الفريق اللي كان معه ونحن ما لازم ننسى إنه قبل بسنتين يعني سنة 23 هو أعطي الليجون دونار لأنه كان من الشباب العرب يلي انضم إلى الجيش الفرنسي ولكن هو كان عنده فكرة تانية إنه هو إذا أنا عم بنضم هو لأنكم أنتم تلحى تساعدونا ونحن نطور البلاد ونحسن أوضاعها ويصير هالانتداب لأنه نحن شعوب غير ناضجة بعد لاستلام مقاليد الحكم وأنه تقدر تقوم بحقيقة بناء أوطان فكانت النتيجة إلى الله أنه هم عم يهدموا الأوطان After two years of heavy fighting, 6,000 rebels were killed and a hundred thousand Syrians displaced. The revolt was ultimately put down by French forces. But Fawzi al-Khawaji continued his struggle. In 1948, he led the Arab Liberation Army of Volunteers in Al-Nakba, meaning the catastrophe, the Arabic term referring to the founding of Israel. كان بعدين أنا سألته سؤال فوزي باشا إنه كيف كنت ينضموا لك السوار قال لي أنت بدك تستغرب يحيى إنه أنا كل الشباب اللي إجوا اللي ينضموا بالثورة أكان سنة الخمسة وعشرين أو سنة الستة وثلاثين أو سنة الثمانة وأربعين يجوا بسلاحهم يعني كل واحد حامل البندقية تاعته ويسألوا فوزي باشا أنت يا ابني إن شاء الله ما أنك متزوج لا الحمد لله الله أكرمني وأنا متزوج إن شاء الله ما عندك أولاد لا والله الحمد لله أنا متزوج وعندي أولاد طيب أنت على مين يعني تترك هالعيبة تعرف شو قال لي قال لي أنا بعتمد أنه بعد الثورة الحكومات الوطنية هي اللي تأخذ على عتاء تربية أولادي فهالناس هون كان عندهم صدق للوطنية يلي اليوم مع كل أسف يعني بيحزن إنه نشوف إلى ماذا آلت الحال في الدول العربية. The Arab world could not unite to prevent the state of Israel becoming a reality.
in the heart of the Arab world. Of the three British wartime promises, this was the only one that was realized, and the aftermath has been felt throughout the Middle East ever since. In terms of the harvest of misery, the, the suffering, the injustices, the difficulties, the trauma that has resulted from this period from 1918 and the post-war settlement, I think that the First World War is the greatest calamity to befall the Middle East since the Mongols in 1250 and the bubonic plague in the 14th century. And I don't think that this is actually an overstatement. The whole debate about sectarianism, the whole debate about Arab nationalism, the whole debate about the role of the state, the whole debate about corruption, about the elite, all of those elements now Arabs and, and others are engaged on in 2014 were rooted there. And I think in addition to all of that, the fingerprint of the outsiders in that time, British France in 2014, 15, the Americans, it's the same with different players in some stages. But the same scenarios, the same ideas, the same slogan, the same debates, sometimes with different players. The new Middle East was formed by the First World War. Many hoped the end of the war would herald a new age of independence and peace. But the region has proved to be one of the most tragic and troubled of modern times. And a hundred years on, is still striving to find that lasting peace.